Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, we're just waiting for a couple more attendees and we'll start off at 7 p.m. sharp. If you have any questions, please feel free to call me on the phone um, or text me on the phone. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we'll be starting in one more minute. All right, um, good evening everyone and welcome to our strategic liver flu control webinar. We're delighted to have everyone here tonight for what is going to be a really fantastic and informative session. Uh, so my name is David and I'll be your moderator tonight. Um, to begin, I'd just like to go through a bit of housekeeping. So those who have logged in tonight, you should be able to hear myself um, and also be able to see the screen which currently shows my mobile number. Um, all participants, except for myself and the presenter, are currently on mute, um, just to ensure minimal background noise. If you do wish to contact me, however, for example, if you're having technical issues or if you have a question about the presentation, you can text or call the number on your screen, or alternatively, you can use the live chat tool, which I'll explain in the next slide. So here on this slide, you can see an image of the webinar control panel, which should be on your screen now if you're joining from a computer. If you can't see the full control panel, you can actually click on the button shown inside those yellow circles. It's an orange rectangle with an arrow pointing to the right. Um, you can click on that to expand to the full view um, of the control panel. Now, if you do have questions or would like to chat with me during the session, you can simply click on the questions tab circled in red and this will bring down a drop down menu and you can actually type your question into the area shown by the red arrow. Remember, you can also text me throughout your, the presentation um, if you have any questions. Uh, now, please feel free to send in any questions throughout the session. If they're urgent, I will reply immediately via chat or text. Otherwise, we'll save any questions to be answered a little bit later. All questions are anonymous and they can only come through to me, so please don't uh, feel shy in asking any questions if they pop up. Um, in addition to that, if you want my attention at any time at all, um, you can actually click on the little hand symbol, uh, which is circled in green. Um, this just alerts me that you might need some attention and I can find out what you need. So that's all the housekeeping down. Uh, I'd like to kick on and just find out a little bit about the audience tonight before we start the webinar. So what I'm about to do is launch a quick poll, um, which um, we'll be able to be seen on your lap if you're on a laptop or computer um, and simply just select the answer that best applies to you. So I'll just launch the first question. So on your screen now, um, the question is, where are you currently located? Um, and please select the answer that applies to you. All right, I'll give it a couple more seconds. All 
Okay, I'll just close that poll off. Um, and I'll just actually share that poll. So tonight we've actually got uh, a large majority from New South Wales um, and a couple of people from Victoria as well as Queensland. I'll just share one more poll question. So you'll be able to see it launch now. Um, so what kind of operation do you run? Um, please feel free to select all that apply. All right, I'll be just closing that poll off. And I'll also share the results as well. Um, so as you can see, um, we've got primarily beef producers, 75%. Um, we've also got 23% sheep producers and 19% other. All right, so I'll finish off with that. Um, so now that we know a little bit about everyone here tonight, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Tim Elliott. So Tim is a large animal scientist uh, large animal scientists are uh, currently living in Armidale with experience in sheep and beef cattle farming uh, and has a particular interest in animal parasitology and drug resistance. He has worked with universities, vets, government departments and pharmaceutical companies in Australia as well as abroad. Tonight, Tim's presentation will look at what strategic liver fluke control actually means in 2020 with some insights into new research and tips on integrated parasite management with a liver fluke focus. So thank you and over to you, Tim. Thanks very much for that, David. Uh, yes, thanks everyone for coming along to have a bit of a, a chat about liver fluke today. I think liver fluke is gonna be one of the, the big areas in parasitology that we're gonna have to focus on in the coming years because it's becoming quite a problem. And with the, the livestock prices at the moment, we need to make sure that we're getting the most out of our livestock and keep their production going ahead. So going straight along into it, so I can get my mouse to work. Before you can do any sort of control on a parasite, a bug, a disease or anything like that, the first thing you need to do is actually understand the life cycle. Now the life cycle of liver fluke is a bit different than what you'd normally see with say sheep barbers pole worm or a scow worms or anything like that where all the development stage that happens on the pasture, it just happens on the pasture by itself. It doesn't need an intermediate host. Where with liver fluke, it requires an intermediate host, which is the freshwater snail. And the most common one that we have in Australia is the one called Ostrepoplea tomentosa. It's quite a small snail. It's nothing like the one you see on your back porch after a rain or anything like that. And the big key with this guy is, it is it's totally aquatic it must be in water. So if there's no water, there's no liver fluke, well, there's no liver fluke snail. So running through the basic life cycle of the liver fluke, and we'll start from, say, a sheep that is infected with liver fluke that are laying eggs. Now, the eggs get passed out in the feces, so they come out from the liver into the small intestine and then go out into the feces. The interesting thing with these guys is that one liver fluke can lay up to 50,000 eggs a day. So that's a lot, a lot of eggs going out on pasture. Now, if they land on pasture on dry ground, they will not develop and it's not a problem. However, if these eggs here then get deposited into, say, a water source such as a dam overflow, a gully, a creek or something like that, these little myricidia can, uh, little eggs can hatch and turn into things called myricidia. These little myricidia hatch out and they swim around in the water and they've got some sort of snail seeking device that I'm not too sure whether anyone really knows how they do it, but they seek out the snail and they must penetrate the snail and go and infect the snail within 24 hours. A lot of the time their lifespan is only a couple of hours and it's very, very uh, dependent on temperature. Once in the snail, they actually uh, go through several different life stages in the snail, the sporocyst, the radii and the cercaria. When they're in this stage here, they can actually uh, multiply themselves. So one myricidia coming in can actually turn into several or 40 or 50 cercaria coming out. So there's a, it's not a reproduction, it's like a daughter cell stage coming into that parasite or coming into that snail. About six to eight weeks after the snail has been infected, temperatures are fine. These little uh, liver fluke 
uh, stages called the Sicaria, then erupt out of the snail and go swimming out into the water again. And what they're looking for here is vegetation in the water. So when they find vegetation, they latch on and they perform this cyst. And the cyst is probably about the size of the tip of a ballpoint pen, quite small. You can see it with the, with the bare eye, but you have to really know what you're looking for. This is the infectious stage. So this is the stage that the animals come along, they're grazing into these wet swampy areas. They pick up the grass that has this cyst, cyst attached and it's attached very, 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 very well. You can't wash it off or anything like that. They in, ingest that and the whole life cycle goes around again. Now, this life cycle can take six months from the time you have an egg here, to the time we go around into the snail, the uh, different stages within the snail, back out, eaten by the host again, and back to an egg is six months. That's in ideal conditions. The other interesting thing here is that liver fluke are not a specific parasite. They're not only a sheep parasite or a cattle parasite. They are anything with a liver they'll take in. And they think there's up to 17 million people in the world actually infected with liver fluke. So it's not just a, a livestock problem. It's actually a human health issue. Down here, we're looking at the fasciola hepatica. That's the only one we get in Australia. Luckily, we don't get this one here. That's more of an Asian parasite, and it's a lot bigger and a lot more pathogenic. So once the sicaria or the, the metasicaria has been ingested by the animal, what happens is it goes down into the uh, digestive tract of the, say for the, this sake, sake, a cow. When it passes through and enters the small intestine, the liver sits right next to the small intestine. The start of the duodenum would be about here and runs along. Once they get into the duodenum, they know that the liver's there and they punch through this, the duodenum with the small intestine and then they just make a hole in the liver and they migrate through. And they're just like little machetes and they just slice their way through. They're very, very small. And what they're doing is they're hunting their way through, they're chopping, they're eating, and they're causing a lot of hemorrhaging, a lot of scarring along the way. What they're trying to do is get into the bile ducts. Now, the bile ducts of a liver, think of it's a liver, it's quite big in, a, in an adult cow, and it's got all these finger-like tubes all through it, and that's where the bile runs. That's where the liver fluke wants to go. So it takes about eight weeks for it to get to the stage where it's actually in the bile ducts. So for those first two to four weeks, they're migrating through, they're chopping through the liver, start eating, heading into the, the bile ducts, enter the bile ducts, and then by about 12 weeks, they're a full-grown adult parasite. They start shedding their eggs. And the other trick that liver fluke have, where most parasites, they have a male and a female, liver fluke are hermaphrodites. So every fluke lays eggs, and they can self-fertilize or they can fertilize by mating. So it's quite a tricky little one they've got there. And remember, one parasite can lay 50,000 eggs. But unlike barber's pole or black scale worm or ossetagia in sheep, where the eggs get deposited straight out into the digester, the eggs get deposited out into the gallbladder here. And they form this little like a reservoir of eggs sitting here. And then as the bile gets excreted out into the small intestine, that's when the eggs get shed out. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on when we discuss the diagnostics and how you actually determine whether your animals have got liver fluke. So here's some classic pictures or a classic picture on the left. This is two adult parasites, the liver fluke. They've got one little mouth here and another mouth here. One holds on to the bile duct and the other one scratches away and sucks blood. When you see all the darkness through here, these little black lines here, that's actually the host blood. So that's what they've been digesting. They've been sucking the blood in, digesting it, then they spit it back out. These things are a couple of mils long. They're very easy to see when you've done a post-mortem on an animal. And here on the right, we have a classic sign of a liver that is very, very heavily infected with liver fluke. So instead of it all being this beautiful, deep maroon color, we've got all this damage here. And these things here are raised bile ducts because the parasites are in there pushing away. And I'm sure if you cut the, the liver there, there'd be liver fluke just fly out of that liver. They're very, very impressive, and you can't miss them when you actually see the, see the, um, the fluke come out. But as you can see, when you have an organ within an animal that is looking like this, it is not functioning at its highest. If the organ's not functioning at its highest, neither is the animal. So the other thing is, where are the liver fluke? 
And we have a couple of main regions of liver fluke. This is from the MLA cattle atlas. And we've got a picture of Australia. And these are the only regions that we get liver fluke. And the only re that reason that is, is purely that's where the snail is. That's where the, the freshwater snail that they need, that, that little Australopithecia tomentosa, that's where it lives. The other uh, interesting thing is we do have the intermediate host in Western Australia, but Western Australia has quarantine measures of when livestock, including horses, get moved from the eastern states to Western Australia, that they get drenched out first. So Western Australia is actually liver fluke free, which is pretty amazing. It's very good. But the thing that happens here is all these areas, that's where your liver fluke snail is, and that's why we get the infections. So at the last check at about 2005, they think about 50 million sheep and 6 million cattle graze areas of pasture that are infected with liver fluke and between 60 and $90 million in loss production per annum. That's a 15 year old figure now. It's probably well over that. So it's one of the parasites we really need to, to get on top of. But as we'll discuss a little bit later on, there's been a few issues for us trying to control it. So the impact of liver fluke. The impact that we see are the, the most dramatic ones is you can have up to a 28% reduction in growth rates. Now that's huge. When you think about, we'll mainly focus on cattle for this for this talk, but if you have some growing steers that should be putting on two kilos or say a day, you've got them on good pasture, you've got everything going, you knock them back by 28%, that's 28% of profits being taken away. And here we have the liver fluke sitting there, that's all the different sizes you can see, they're all the same age. The other thing that we often see with liver fluke is in females, you get a reduction in fertility. So it takes them longer to get pregnant they have to do more cycles or they have to get more AIs or the ball stays in for longer or they get cold because they don't get pregnant. So that's a huge, huge problem when you can't get the, the animals pregnant. And one of the areas that I did a little work on with a PhD was doing in dairy areas where we're seeing huge uh, milk production losses. And it's not just the quantity, but it's also the quality of the milk that is uh, being produced by the cattle that have got this uh, large liver fluke infection. Now you'd think that, you know, that's milk production, that's just a problem for dairy guys, but it's actually a big problem for beef cattle producers as well. Because if you've got your cow there, who's got a young calf and the calf is suckling from the mum and the mum's milk production is lower than it should be or its quality is lower, that calf is not gonna grow as well as what it should. So it's a big, big problem. There's huge numbers when you th think about it of the areas of uh, losses that occur, but these ones are probably one of some of the bigger ones. And in really, really uh, heavy infestations, you will get deaths. You see deaths a lot more in sheep, just like because they can't handle the infection as well as what a, a cow can. But in cows, you can see very, very sick animals from it. Once you've seen those clinically ill uh, cattle, you're in a lot of trouble because it's, it's a bit of the tip of the iceberg. By the time you start seeing visual signs of the problem in cattle, there's been a lot of subclinical losses going on. So that's why one of the reasons we always talk about the, you know, why you treat certain times a year, when you do this, look for that. And it's all to do with the snail. So it's not so much that we want to treat the animal strategically because it's pre-lambing like we do with, uh, with sheep or a weaning dose like we do with, with our lambs or with uh, winter cattle, but it's more to do with the activity of the snail. And here's some charts here of some different regions. And the biggest thing that really affects these guys is the mean temperature. They want a mean temperature of above 10 degrees because when it gets too cold, what the snails do is they'll actually go down into the mud and they hibernate. And they just, they, they shut right down. So if you have the snail in a sort of a state of doing nothing, just hibernating, that means the infection cycle is slowed right down. They can take an infection down with them if their snails are currently infected, but if they're not out in the springs or the gullies and act actively going around, that means they're not actively getting infected. So the biggest thing while we talk about timing of treatments, and we'll talk about that a bit later on, and Matt will as well, it's all to do with a snail and why we need to really look at that. And the other age-old question I get, I mean, Southeastern Australia for the last year, 2019 was probably one of the driest years we've had for a long time. and Usually with parasites like the normal worms, when you have dry years, when there's very little pasture on the ground, all the time what happens is there's a big reduction in parasite burdens because it's not 
a suitable environment for the worms to try and hatch on the pasture because a lot of the time there is no pasture. But what we saw is in these really dry times, so we actually saw an increase in the number of cases that with liver fluke and some pretty serious cases of liver fluke. And it's not so much to do with the the um, the host in this uh, the uh, the snail on this side because when the dry comes, the the wet areas such as your springs and gullies they actually reduce as well. So the environment for the snail is getting worse. But the big thing is is the animals are going down and grazing those wet areas because if there's very little pasture out of the paddock block normal, that's where they go. They're going to go down. They're hunting the grain feed, hunting any sort of feed, and also they might be getting water from there as well. So we do see a big big spike then. And the other thing we were seeing is if it's in a dry time, a lot of time the animals are nutritionally stressed. As soon as you put nutritional stress on any sort of animal, the risk of them getting a disease, whether it be a, a clostridial disease or a parasite or anything like that, is increased remarkably because those animals are not getting the nutritional requirements met. Then on the opposite side, if you've had lots of rain, things are going really well, lots of pasture, what you can get is you get a lot more of the intermediate host. So the snail population actually increases because you've made the environment, or the environment has become really, really good for the snail. So the areas of fluke risk can spread, but depending on how heavily you're grazing your pasture, hopefully the animals won't be going down there as much. But you usually always get some animals going down there, chasing those wet areas, getting that green pick coming along. When you have paddocks like this, where it's just flat, dry, and there's no artificial, uh, no natural water sources. This is perfect for no liver fluke at all. And that's why a lot of times people will know that they have really, really fluky paddocks and they have paddocks that they know they don't have fluke in them. And it's purely got to do with the layout of the paddock. If it's flat, dry, and the water's coming from a trough, there's probably no way they're going to get a fluke. But if it's full of springs and gullies, that's the reason why they're going to get lots of fluke in there. So, when you think about you know, liver fluke, quite a few people go, I don't have liver fluke. But all of a sudden they get hit by liver fluke and they say, oh, I don't know where it came from or I must have got it from somewhere else. But a lot of time it can be sort of just poking along at very, very low levels. And until we get those stresses like a really dry year or a really wet year, they don't really raise their head too much. So the diagnostic, the things that we look at for the three questions that whenever you're going to use a, a diagnostic test, what are the three questions that you ask? Now, the first one is, do my cattle have liver fluke? This is a, a pretty obvious question. And it's probably one of the ones that you get asked all the time. With liver fluke, we have lots of different diagnostic tests. With normal worms, we usually just have the fecal egg count. That's the main one we use. But for liver fluke, we have quite a few different tests. But they all have their pros and they all have their cons. So the, the interest of uh, the question of, I've never tested for liver fluke, my cattle aren't doing very well, could I have liver fluke? There's three sort of main tests we could do. The liver fluke fecal egg count. Now this is where you go and you collect feces from uh, quite a few different animals, send them off to the lab. They do a sedimentation test and they'll come back and say the animals are positive or negative or they'll give you a number. The other way we can do it is a serum elizer. Now a serum elizer, if it's in beef cattle, we usually have to bleed the animals. So it does take either a vet to come out there and bleed your cattle or you need someone who knows what they're doing to do it. But the other way you can do with this guy with the serum elizer is it can be done on milk samples. So it's a very, very good test for dairy guys because you can just take some out of the vat, send it off, get it tested. And the other one that's been pretty uh, recent is the copper antigen elizer. So it, it relies on feces. Same as what we do with a liver fluke fecal egg count, but it can detect the fluke a little bit uh, younger than what a fecal egg count can because it can only detect, we can detect the animals, the parasites before they start laying eggs. So they're the three main ones you should look at there for liver fluke. I'll come back to them in a second, show the pros and cons. The other one is you may have a, a cow or a heifer or something like that that's gone down, she's really crook and you're not too sure what's going on. So we can use the same tests as what we've done up here your liver fluke fecal egg count, a serum elizer, or a copper antigen elizer. But if you've had a vet out, we can also test for our liver enzymes. Now these are sort of an indirect way you can actually, you're detecting liver damage, not so much uh, liver fluke. So you see where there's certain enzymes such as GGT are, are raised. 
And then the other one, which is a, a very crucial one that we're starting to try and get more people to do, is did my last fluke branch work? Now, we pretty much only get left with two when we're doing this. We can either do the fake leg count or the copper and Eliza. The other crucial thing with this is, whenever you're doing this, uh, did my last fluke branch work, ideally you know that those animals did have fluke when you drenched them. And then we want to come in 21 to 28 days after the drench and we collect another sample, send them off to the lab. And if the sample comes back positive, that means we have an issue. Now this is usually only used for triclobendazole because triclobendazole should kill all the parasites or call all the stages, but it can be used for other uh, drugs that only kill the adults, but you should have to use a bit of caution and talk to your, your vet or your consultant before you, you sort of make any rash decisions. Now, the reason why these two are the only ones we can really do is because the liver enzymes will hang around for a little while and serum ELISA relies on antibodies. So we can't use antibodies to detect whether a drench worked because you can have animals that are antibody positive, you drench them, you remove all the liver fluke, but the antibodies still are circulating around in the blood. So we check them again with the serum ELISA and all of a sudden we say that the, the antibodies are still there, but it doesn't tell us whether the infection is actually running. And that's where the likes of the copper antigen ELISA and the liver fluke egg count can do that because it'll only pick up an infection that is actually running. The other thing that we see with the problem that we see with liver fluke fecal egg counts and copper antigen ELISA, they can be quite variable in the results. And a lot of it's got to do with the way that the eggs or the antigens are deposited out from the gallbladder. Like I was saying before, the gallbladder acts like a big reservoir for all the eggs that get shed out. So as the digester runs through the animal, the bile gets squirted out and bile is a harsh salt and it breaks down lipids. So as the uh, digester goes through, the bile gets squirted out and as it gets squirted out, the eggs come out. But it's intermittent. It's not consistent all the time. It's not a meal every hour or anything like that. It can be really variable. And the egg output can be very variable from the, from the parasite. So we have issues there. But that's pretty much a biological issue because of the way the eggs come out not so much a test issue, but the big thing is we are aware of it and that's the key thing. So whenever you're going to do any sort of testing for liver fluke, you should be asking which question am I trying to answer here to work out what test you're going to use because it's crucial that you use the right test at the right time. So the other thing that we uh, see is the treatments. I mean, pretty much uh, treating liver fluke is the only way you can actually get rid of the adult or the parasites within the host. There's no other way to do it. So we've been quite spoiled really for the last few years because we've had some really good drugs come out. But unfortunately, we're starting to see a few issues. But the big thing you really need to know about A, with all the drugs, is not all the drugs are the same. So you'll see some of the ones down the bottom here only kill the 12-week or 14-week old fluke. So that means those parasites have been going around in that animal for 12 weeks, causing all that really bad migration damage through here. And you're only knocking these guys out. So if you drench them with say these products here, but you've got young fluke, those animals are still have liver fluke in them in another couple of weeks and they'll start laying eggs. So this one here, triclobendazole has been pretty much the mainstay of liver fluke control since the 1930s, when oh, not the 1930s, but 30 years from the 1980s when uh, Joe Bore worked out this drug. It's been the backbone of all of our um, liver fluke control and it's worked fantastic because you can see it gets down to the young age of fluke. And some of these older ones, so these ones here, Clauslin, it's usually in combination with ivermectin. Albendazole is a, a broad spectrum drench. It's a bit hit and miss with liver fluke really. And this one, oxyclozonide, it's uh, good for knocking out the adults and it's usually combined with levamazole. But recently we've been pushing more, the same as what we've been doing with sheep parasitology with barber's bowl, black scale, uh, small brown stomach worm, is using combinations. And one of the benefits of using combinations is we can kill the younger fluke as well. That's one of the big keys. Because whenever you put two things together, hopefully they'll work a lot better than just having one by themselves, or most of them they do. And then sometimes in these cases, you actually get synergy where they work a lot better. So the other, well, the biggest problem that we're really starting to see is all of the drenches that we've started to been using now for 20, 30 years are starting to fail. We're starting to see some huge, huge problems 
with triclopin as our resistance. So as I was saying, it's been the backbone of our liver fluid control in Australia for 30 years. It's been fantastic for the dairy guys. It was pretty much at dry off. You put a triclopinazole down their throat and away they go. That was mainly because you can't treat lactating animals with triclopinazole because it's got a, a long milk withhold. So that was when you had to do it. And it's been treating us really well. But we've been seeing a lot, a lot of resistance. And in Australia, we've been seeing quite a bit of it. We've seen it in dairy cattle. We've seen it in beef cattle. It's unfortunately, the more and more we look, the more and more we find. So these counts here, all these ones here, this is from a paper that was from a couple of years ago, looking at this as a global sort of uh, impact. So you can see pretty much all of them having a few issues. I think some of these uh, ones here, a lot of the time we don't really know because we haven't tested them. But with this one here, Clausulin, the interesting thing with this guy is, it says it can get the late immature from the oral. Now, Australia, we do not have this uh, option for us. We only get the injectable, which is at the lower dose rate than what the oral is. The oral can get down to the lower, the immature stage, but we can only get to the adult stage. Cosandal, it is only registered in sheep. We cannot use it in cattle. And it gets down about the late immature stage. Nitroxidol by itself, we can't really get anymore because that was the old drug Trodax, but I don't think we can buy it anymore. And then we come down to the, the combinations like nitroxyl and clausulin that Matt will talk about a little bit later on. And it's a good combination, gets down to the, the really young fluke. And we've had no reports of resistance to that yet. And hoping to keep it that way. And it's the same with oxyclozonide. We've had no reports of resistance to that yet around the world. But this guy only kills the adult liver fluke. So as you can see here, we're starting to push ourselves into a bit of a corner. And that's where we really need to take a, a, a considered approach on how we control liver fluke and the type of drenching that we do, because we want to use the right drench at the right time. That's the most important thing, because when you start using the wrong drench at the wrong time or the right drench at the wrong time, that's when you really start to select for resistance, which is pretty much exactly what we don't want to do. We want to try and maintain our drugs for as long as we can. Now, the beauty of liver fluke is one of the best ways you can actually control liver fluke is grazing management. Because we know where these snails are, without the snail, there is no liver fluke. So if we can see, the, go along our edges of our gullies and creeks here, and these are actually snails sitting right along the edge there. This is where you usually find them, right on the corners there, just where the water is. Now, if we restrict the grazing of the animals to those areas, we control the liver fluke. So fencing off your springs and your gullies is probably one of the best ways to do it. However, not on all farms, that's practical. You might have really steep gullies, you can't really get a fence down, and it's just not going to be economically viable. So the other way is grazing management. Graze those swamps and gully areas towards the end of winter, say, when uh, you know the snails aren't active. So if you do shed stuff on there, if they do go there to graze it, they should minimise the risk that they're actually going to pick up the infection. Also graze your adult animals. Try not to graze your young growing animals in these highly risk area or high risk areas, because as we've seen, they're the ones that really knock around their growth. And if you slow down the growth of an animal too much, they really struggle to produce as an adult animal. So if you do have to graze your, your swampy areas that you know have got a pretty high burden of liver fluke, Try and push your adult animals onto it as well. Now, this one here, I've had quite a few people say to me, well, I'll just go in there and I'll kill the snails. If I kill the snails, I'll get rid of the liver fluke. Great idea. And that's what people tried doing many, many years ago. They'd throw copper sulfate and that sort of stuff all through the gullies or through the swamps. And it's exactly what we do not want to try and do. A, it doesn't work that well because you may be able to knock out, say, this generation of snails here but there'll be egg sacs from these little guys sitting around that won't get killed by the chemical. And then when the chemical washes away, they'll hatch again. But the big problem is, is all the, all the other impact that you'll have, you'll kill pretty much everything else in that little swamp. And it's exactly what we don't want to do. It's got a great little ecosystem there. So to try and knock out one parasite and knock out the snails, you're going to have such a huge impact on the environment. It's just not worth doing. And it's been proven time and time again, really not to hunt the snail because it doesn't work. You're not going to try and kill it chemically. If you want to try and reduce the population down, just use your grazing management or your fencing off your springs. Don't let the animals go in there. That's probably the, the key take home message from that. So on that, I'll flip back to David now and he's got a bit of a poll. 
and then we will we'll keep going about why the strategic times are, are very, very important. So I'll flip back over to you, David, that's all right. Thanks, Tim. Um, so I've just, I'll just put a poll question on the screen now. Um, so the question is, when do you usually treat for fluke? Um, is it autumn only, spring only, autumn and spring, autumn, spring and summer, or all year round? Just give it a couple more seconds. All right, just about to close the voting. Okay, I'll just close it now and I'll actually share it onto the screen, the results. So we can see that 35% uh, treat in autumn only, 38% autumn and spring, 15% um, autumn, spring and summer, and then all, all year round 8% and 4% spring only. So I'll just hide that and back to you, Tim. Perfect. That really works out very well because the next slide is the same one we saw before of where the activity of the snail is. And it sounds like by the looks of it with you guys doing your autumn and your spring and then your autumn and your spring summers, that's exactly what we're trying to do. So the reason why that autumn drench, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard, you know, the two A's, the April and August, is we need to knock out that population here. So as the as the, the liver fluke snail is starting to, to go to sleep, it goes down, hibernates in the mud, the infection goes down. If we can knock out the population here, and as we come across to here, there should be very, very little contamination coming out of spring. Another key point of that is a lot of us, if you're a spring carver, you've got pregnant animals going through all that time. So it's important that you don't want those animals to have liver fluke going through. And You'll see here we've got SM, which is the summer metascaria, and the winter metascaria. So the metascaria, which is the infectious cyst on the pasture, with one of those swampy areas, actually lasts longer in the winter, but there's not new ones coming out. So they last longer, but there's no new ones replacing them along the way. So a lot of the time what happens is you get the spring, the winter metascaria infecting you in spring. So that's why it's important that we knock them out here and then if we do have any um, metascaria sitting on the pasture at this time, as they get infected coming out of spring, we knock them out again. This will stop the egg production going out onto the pasture and infecting us again back around. So think of it, it's, it's like trying to, uh, not so much flatten the curve like with COVID, but you're trying to reduce the amount of eggs going out there exposed to the snails. Because if you can reduce the number of eggs going to the snails, you can reduce the number of metascaria in six months being produced to your livestock. So that guy there, that autumn treatment, and then the spring treatment are very, very, uh, very, very um, necessary. An autumn treatment by itself, if you're in a liver fluke endemic area, is gonna help, but that spring treatment will definitely help a lot more because by the time you come around to your next autumn, your infection will be a lot lower because you've would have knocked out anything in your spring here. So as a minimum, an autumn and a spring treatment in a liver fluke prone area are, are a must. And if you're in a very, very fluky area, you've got lots of fluky paddocks, I think you've got to throw that summer one in as well. It's a very, very important one to do. Now, the thing you can do with this guy as well is back what I was saying before of like you, you've got to know what's working. If you seriously go through and test your animals and say you've done your test here in, in autumn, you know you've got liver fluke in there, do your test. And so you come in with a, a trickle of endosol based product and then come back 21 to 28 days later and get some feces again, because you need to know now whether that drench has worked. Because if it hasn't worked, you need to come in and drench them again. Because the last thing you want to do is have all of these trickle of endosol resistant parasites carried across all the way into winter, because they're the ones that are going to infect you again in spring. So it's very, very uh, good timing to actually check whether your drenches are working. Okay, so I think that's pretty much it from me. I'll flick back to David now. Thank you, Tim. Uh, so uh, we've just got a couple of questions and if you do have any questions, please feel free to um, send them in 
um, to me and I can ask them. Um, so the first question is, how can you control the snail if fencing, for example, isn't an option? Uh, very hard, unless you can drain the areas. Uh, that's been one of the ways if, if you got some, um, you can rip it or something like that. But if you can't really fence it out, it's, there's really a hard way to try and stop them because you can't really control the snail by itself. The only way you can do it is by restricting the grazing of those animals in that area. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Um, and one more question um, to you is, are young cattle more prone to getting liver fluke than adult cattle? Yep, they sure are. They've never been exposed to it before. They're you know, immunologically wise, they're not nowhere near as good as what an adult cow is. So they definitely get fluke a lot. Well, the, the number of fluke that would uh, be taken at, in a young cow would be a lot more than what would be in an adult cow. And in adult cows, when you see them in a post-mortem or anything like that, you'll see they have these big calcification. So it's a really good response that the cow does get to the liver fluke. Um, the other thing, thinking of uh, liver fluke and cutting up livers, another way to find out whether your farm's got liver fluke is if you send stuff to the abattoirs or straight to the abs or something some like that, ask for a report back on your offal. Because part of the thing when uh, any carcasses go through an abattoir is they, um, they look at the liver for liver fluke and they'll condemn the offal if it's got liver fluke. So if you can get reports back and say, 50% you know, of your offal was condemned because of liver fluke, you know you've got a problem there. But if they come back and say, none of your offal is condemned, you, you must be doing pretty well. Yep, thank you. Uh, and I'll just have one more question and before we go into Matt's section. Um, so the question is, what's an ideal rotation of drenches for a spring and autumn drench in cattle? Yes, good point. Uh, it depends on the type of uh, livestock production you're doing. When are you selling your wieners? When are you carving? I think Matt's going to go into a lot more detail on that because that's very, very much a, a farm specific area. But I think looking at this, you always want to, whatever you use, say in your autumn drench, you should be using a different one as your spring drench. So the ideal way, I think, talk to your vet or your rep and you'll have a very good idea after you, you listen to Matt about where your treatments are going to fit in, I think. So I can't say use drug X, drug Y at this point in time, but I think Matt's going to go into a lot more detail with that. Okay, thank you, Tim. All right, so I'll kick on um, and we can answer plenty more questions at, at the end of the session. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our second speaker for tonight, Dr. Matt Bohr. Uh, so currently Matt is a vet and owner of Beacon Vet Veterinary um, up in the north coast of New South Wales. He is also the Senior Livestock Technical Services Manager at Verbac Animal Health. He has 18 years experience helping cattle farmers in a range of clinical advisory as well as research roles. And his current employment actually spans jobs in clinical practice, government, as well as industry. Uh, tonight, Matt will be leading us through a really interactive session looking at the different actives and also how to build a strategic liver flu control program on your property. So I'll hand it over to Matt. Right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, David, and thank you, Tim, for all that great information. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to talk about the available products that you can get to control liver fluke. So welcome to my virtual store. As you can see, we're having a look at a few shelves and we've certainly got a lot of choice in fluke products in a typical store in Australia. So the question is, well, how do we know what to buy? Um, the truth is that one size doesn't fit all. You can't just pick one of these products off the shelf and always use that forever on everyone's farm. The right product for someone at one time of the year may be totally not appropriate for someone else's enterprise. So what we're going to do some time now is just imagine that we're coming into the store, we know we need to buy a fluke product, and what are some of the things that you decide would work best for you? Now, a key thing in that decision process is what time of the year are you coming into the store or what stage of production are you at? So. We saw those answers that David um, had. Uh, we asked a question about what is the time of year that most people um, are thinking about treating for fluke. And, you know, a large majority of people were definitely treating um, just in autumn or in autumn and spring. And some people were treating actually in autumn, spring and summer. 
So when we start having a look at our products, there certainly is a difference in what products we should use in sheep and beef cattle in autumn and what products would we should probably use in dry off in dairy cattle. And the reason why is that these are really key strategic times to control liver fluke and we need to choose a product that can remove as many fluke as possible right down to the youngest stage. And that's because, as Tim has explained, we're trying to target weaknesses in the fluke cycle. So if we have a look um, in our store at the products that we've got available, um, the products on the top shelf are the three products that are able to control down to the lowest level of fluke, so the youngest. And so the best label claims in Australia say that they can control early immature, including the two week stage. So out of these products on the top, for sheep producers and for dairy producers, only flucazole um, is an option. Um, for beef producers, they have the advantage of the newer products, which are Nitrofluke and Nitromec on the left and in the middle. Now, so those products can get right down to the two week stage. Our next best options are products that can get down to around the four week stage, assuming the chemicals are working okay. And some examples of that are our triclobendazole containing products like our Fluke Care in the middle here and our Fazanex, which is the next one there. All the rest of the products, it's not that they do not have a role for Fluke and we'll cover that. It's just that if you wanna do the absolute best job against Fluke and that includes at dry off for dairy cattle and in autumn in beef and sheep, then your products like your Verbamec Plus, your Ivermec Plus, your Nilzan, and these products, they are only targeting a much older stage of fluke. So you will leave a lot of fluke behind in the animal. So that's important to realize. So it then gets down to, well, you know, what should you um, choose to do? And I'm just gonna start talking a little bit about dairy cows, because I know there are people in the audience who said they had dairy cows. So during lactation in dairy cows, because of milk residues, you actually can't use any of the products that contain triclobendazole. So that includes Fluke Care C, Fazanex, Flucazole, Cydectin Plus Fluke, um, Genesis Ultraporon. All these products, they contain triclobendazole and you can't use them. Now that leaves you with just really Verbamec Plus or Ivermec Plus because the two products at the top here are not registered in dairy cattle. Now, what's important to know is that research shows us that liver fluke mainly only affects production significantly in the early lactation. So it's an important thing to know that using these type of products like Verbamec Plus might be important in first and second lactation of dairy cows, but you may not need to use those in more mature cows, and you can certainly do some testing to check that. What that means is, is that Sometimes this product is not the best product for your worm control, which might actually be more important than fluke. And if you don't need to use a fluke product in older cows, it allows you to use something else for worm control, like a moxidectin in sodectin poron or an aprenomectin in uh, neopranil or epronex. So there's a lot to think about. What basically my key message for dairy producers is, is dry off is the key time. And traditionally, we encourage dairy producers to rely on triclobendazole because you can then use it then. Our problem is, is that with growing resistance to that chemical, we actually now encourage you to use both flucazole at dry off and Verbamec Plus at dry off. And that way you achieve two actives against fluke and two actives against um, worm. So if we um, now get back to beef producers, and we talked about that for beef and for sheep, you ideally want to use one of these top three products in autumn. Well, what does that mean you can use at another time, like say in spring, can you use different products? Well, from what we understand, if it's been a very mild winter, or if your timing of using the fluke drench hasn't been able to be that spot on in autumn and spring, and a simple example of that might be that you want to treat your weaners when you wean them in summer, say in December, well, if that's the case, you probably still need to use the best type of fluke drench you can. So even in springtime, um, if it's been a mild winter, you need to go off the top shelf here. However, if you've had some decent frosts in the winter um, and your timing of your fluke products has been pretty well, that's where for beef producers, you can start to 
consider using just an adult only based product of which here we have an example of Verbamet Plus or even you have a product like Nilzan. We will consider quickly in a minute, is that always the best choice for worm control? But that just is the point that to summarize, you need top shelf ideally for autumn control. In spring in beef, you might be able to drop down to a Verbamec Plus or a Nilzan. So um, I might let have a break from my voice and David, I think you've got another question for us. Yep, that's right, Matt. Um, so I'll just put it onto the screen. Um, so for those of you, how would you describe the resistance to triclobendazole on your farm? Um, please select the answer that applies to you. Um, so it's been confirmed. I suspect it's there or I'm not sure. All right, couple more seconds. And closing that poll off. And I'll share it onto the screen now. Um, so we can see 84% um, aren't sure if they've got triclobendazole resistance, 12% um, suspect it's there, and 3% um, say that it's been confirmed on their property. All right, back to you, Matt. Okay, thanks a lot for that, um, David. So look, I think um, that poll result was pretty interesting, and I, I'm not surprised by that. Resistance um, is hard to detect in liver fluke. And if 3% of people have had it confirmed, it's definitely going to be on many, many properties because most people have not looked for it. Um, we know from research surveys that resistance to fluke drenches, meaning they're not working properly anymore, can be a real problem. Um, and as Tim mentioned, the products that contain triclobendazole, such as Fluke Care and Fazanex and some of the others, we have over relied upon them. So what we should talk about is what can we do? Um, it's very important as beef, sheep and dairy producers that we consider some form of rotation away from triclobendazole containing products and especially if possible, use some combination products. So first of all, I want to click and show you about the triclobendazole containing products in our store here. So here's an example of a triclobendazole containing product, Fluke Care. Great product. Historically, we've relied upon it. It can get right down to early immatures, reasonably short withholding period. The problem is, is some emerging resistance to straight triclobendazole products. Another example to zoom in in our store is Fazanex. Very similar idea. Um, good idea, early and mature, but see that this product only contains triclobendazole in it, that's it. Um, to show you some other examples, Genesis Poron, it relies on triclobendazole in it. You can see that in the list of actives. And as we're going through our store, if you look at Cydectin plus Fluke, it's also relying on triclobendazole. So you can see lots of products have triclobendazole. Now the message tonight is not to never use those products, they can still be an essential part of your program, but it's important that at some time of the year or in some of your classes of stock, and it might just be your adults, you might need triclobendazole with short withhold in young animals, but in adults we need you to start to consider using definitely some different things. So if we start talking about dairy producers, this is actually very hard because um, there aren't many non-triclobendazole options that control immature fluke. Um, in fact, because the nitro range is not registered for dairy um, from residues, uh, we're really left with only triclobendazole products. So what we recommend to you guys is, I suppose it's a new message, try to use both flucazole and Verbamec Plus at dry off because you achieve a double whammy kill against worms and a double whammy um, kill against fluke. And I'll show you that um, quickly. In flucazole, you have triclobendazole against fluke and oxfendazole against worms, but it also helps with the fluke a little bit as well. And then in Verbamec Plus, you have ivermectin against worms, totally different type of active, and you have clausulon, a totally different active. So in 2020, with emerging resistance problems on dairy farms, um, it certainly is recommended at dry off to do a really good job like that. Now, so for beef producers, it's a lot easier. Um, you, you really need to pick one of the nitro products at some stage in your program. Um, so nitro fluke, 
is a product with labelled claims against triclobendazole resistant strains of fluke, exactly what we need. These are the only range with proven claims against resistant strains, and they'll also get right down to those immature stages. They do that by having these different actives to triclobendazole. You can see the actives in these ones is nitroxanol and clausulon. So um, we also have nitromec, of which the difference is you've got nitroxanol and clausulon, different to triclobendazole, and this one also has ivermectin for worm control. So for beef producers, you certainly can select these products as a choice, um, as your first fluke choice for animals that you're going to retain, such as mature breeders. You can also use them for new arrivals on the farm, and you can also use them in your younger, younger animals that you may sell um, when you can absorb the longer ESI. Someone might say, Matt, you haven't talked enough about sheep, and there were people in the audience with sheep. Well, once again, in sheep, you can't use the nitro products we really need you in sheep to use at least flucazole because it contains two actives which do help each other a bit with fluke. And then in sheep, you've got a real enemy in worms like Barber's pole worm. Um, so you can add it for interest. Nilzan, at some stage you use in your program, it gives you another active against liver fluke, oxyclozonide. You can see that there is an active, and that's totally different to tetra. Uh, to um, the triclobendazole, but um, it only does adult fluke, so you still need flucazole on your farm. Also, in your sheep program, if you are using clozantal based drenches against barber's pole, so there's Clozicare or there's Avamectul, you'll be hitting the adult fluke a little bit with those as well. So, we're running a little bit out of time tonight. We better go to another question, David. Yep. Thank you, Matt. So next question is, and I'll share it onto the screen. When treating your younger cattle, the longest ESI you can generally use is, and please select the one that applies to you. All right, a couple more seconds. And I'll be closing that poll off. And sharing that onto the screen. So we've got a pretty mixed response. So we've got 27% up to 56 days, 29% up to 120 days, 22% up to 140 days, a little bit less, 16%, 42 days and under, and 6% other. So back to you, Matt. So ESI is a really important issue, um, and so what my advice is, is that just understanding the groupings of the products. The products in our store here with the shortest ESI is Nilzan of 14 days, but it only does adult fluke, and um, there's some other limitations of that product. Um, the next group of products which get into the 42-day ESI is your Verbamec Plus and your Ivermec Plus, so that's pretty handy. Um, you can knock off once again, only adult fluke, no immatures, but you know, if, if you only have an opportunity for a short ESI, you've got these products there that you can consider. Um, the next ESIs is your 56 day type ones, and that's your flucazole, um, and also the other um, oral triclobendazole products will also have that. What I recommend is that I mean, this type of product is probably a powerhouse for young animals that you want to give them something with a shortish ESI, but still do a really, really good job. Very common throughout regions of New South Wales and Victoria is you can combine this with another mectin type drench such as Cydectin, and you've got a really powerful program with a very short ESI. What our message though is that that's fine. If we need to do that in our young stock, make sure that you use a product like nitrofluke in your adults, give that into cows, um, or you know something very clever that you can do um, that some people recognize is that when you could use products at pregnancy testing and the ones that are pregnant that you're going to keep, you can give them something like nitrofluke or you could give them nitromec because the ESI will be fine, but the ones that are not pregnant that you're going to sell, you might give them verbamec plus. So one key take home tonight is 
you don't have to do the same thing all the time. Sometimes to have the most profitable enterprise, we need to pick different products at the shelf for different times. Wherever possible, um, a, using a longer ESI product with a better control of fluke is a good idea. I think, David, we might go uh, to skip a question. Can you go to the next question, please? Five? Yep, no worries. So just launching that now. So the question is, do you prefer a product that contains both a worm and fluke treatment together? Couple more seconds. All right, and closing that poll off and showing that on the screen. So a resounding 81% yes, 17% no, and 2% unsure. So back to you, Matt. Thanks so much for that question. And this is really a key point. And to sum up tonight, that was our last question. And I'll just explain. We are usually seeking a worm and fluke solution together. The problem is, is I'm really sorry, but no pharmaceutical company for 2020 can make a single product off the shelf here that will meet all the needs for modern cattle, sheep or dairy production, considering ESIs doing a good job, doing both worm and fluke well, and then we've got the parasites are trying to outsmart our chemicals. So there is no single product you can take off here to do you know, the perfect job. You will need more than one drench product. And it's very important to recognise, well, what are the priorities? For most producers in fluke areas, Ostertagia, the small brown stomach worm, is actually more important than liver fluke. Okay, so we cannot ignore your Ostertagia control program for the sake of fluke. We can attempt to do the best job that we can. We certainly need to consider fluke because, as Tim said, it's got significant production damage. And also, we've got to think something about resistance. So if we have a look um, here and divide these products up, if we're in the market of doing worm and fluke at the same time, we have products such as Verbamec Plus, Ivermec Plus, and Genesis Ultraporon, and Nitromec Injection. So those four products, they all share one thing. They contain Ivermectin in them. Okay, now that might have been fine 10 years ago, but I do need to be honest and say that ivermectin is recognised by scientists as the least potent mectin against worms. So in your young cattle, we really have to be a little bit careful using products that um, only contain ivermectin. And I should just correct myself there, Genesis Ultra is not ivermectin. So it's Nitromec Injection, Verbamec Plus and Ivermec Plus. So you look at these products, um, and it's got the only worming product is ivermectin. So what's happened is worms are starting to outsmart drenches. Um, it is better for us to use actives such as moxidectin, which is in the cydectin range, or abamectin, which happens to also be in Genesis there. That means that I'm sorry, but you are better to separate out them sometimes. And you know, for the best job against worms, you may be better to use a nitrofluke injection as an awesome fluke product and then combine that with a separate worm molecule like in your cydectin. So to give you an example, um, many producers without even thinking about that are commonly using um, another product up here that is just worm and fluke and that's flucazole. So flucazole contains triclobendazole against fluke and oxifendazole against worms. Now, the great thing about that oxfendazole is it's not in most of the drenches you use for worms. And so it's a really, really handy backup. And so if you are to use that product as the, on the same day as, say, a cydectin, um, you are having a great thing against your worms and your fluke. However, if you're over-reliant on that and you're mainly using um, a mectin, um, or cydectin with flucazole, maybe sometimes you need to mix it up and you need to use a nitrofluke instead. So really what I'm saying is none of this is totally easy, but to give you some key points to take home on my shop here so that we can go to any final questions is. From research, we know that it's important to control down as young stage fluke as you possibly can, which means that our three products on the top of the shelf here are the preference when you can. 
we have to consider ESI and in young stock, sometimes that makes flucazole the go-to product because it's only 56 days. However, we can't only use that product on our farm. So it might mean that when we can in replacement stock where we can absorb the ESI, we should be putting some nitrofluke in. A lot of people get very tempted to drift towards an all-in-one Verbamec Plus, Cytectin Plus Fluke or Genesis Porons. These products can have their place. They could be, as I said, suitable for a springtime treatment in a beef operation, but we need to be aware of their limitations. Significant research shows that a poron liver fluke product will not do as well as an oral or injection. And we also need to be aware that these products are often not controlling those very immature stage of fluke, and they may not be giving us the best molecule against worm control. My last message for the night is, please start to think about quarantine treatment. Sheep producers are more aware of this, but what we mean by that is that when you bring in stock from someone else, you need to clean them out to make sure you're not bringing in resistant parasites from other farms. If we look in our shelf here, the absolute best product for quarantine against liver fluke is nitrofluke. Nitrofluke has actives that it will kill all fluke strains currently in Australia. Now, if you then say, well, how do I come up with a program that controls both resistant fluke and worm? You could combine nitrofluke with a registered combination worming drench, and that would be one way of, of dealing with that. So I know we've gone a few minutes over time, but I hope you've got quite a bit of information out of visiting our fluke shop today. I might pass back to you, David. Thank you, Matt. Uh, so I will open the floor to any more questions. Again, if you have any, please feel free to send them in. Um, I'll, I'll let Matt and Tim answer some of the questions uh, that have been asked. So the first question is, can you overdose or give too many doses? So for example, I drench my cattle, but the drench gun uh, stuffed up halfway through. Can I give another oral drench two weeks or four weeks after first? I might answer that one. Um, it's first of all, we should never underdose with any of these products here because that encourages resistance. But we also need to be aware that we're dealing with liver, living creatures and extreme overdosages are a problem. Some of these drenches are extremely safe, um, such as the oral, um, you know, flucazole is very, very safe to redo. Okay, and I'm talking at the moment about same day treatment. You could overdose on the same day and it would be, you'd be very unlucky to have a problem. And the same as these other oral products. Some of the products you need to be a little bit safer with an overdose, like Nilzan, it has a narrow safety margin, we call that as scientists. So you want to be a bit careful. Now, the specific question was, can I retreat again if I'm unsure if they've had it? Well, products have a retreatment interval for ESIs, you do have to be a little bit careful. So for example, as a veterinarian, um, that question comes to me a lot. And I'm usually very concerned with my answer because we have to be very careful for residues for exporting meat overseas. So I tend to say not to retreat within the ESI um, on a product. So that would be 56 days for this one um, and, and would be a long time, for example, for a product like this one. So, um, I guess the answer to the question is it might be safe, but we're in a food production industry and we're not allowed to put chemicals on a lot in case it overdoes for residues. So I hope that answers it. You need to follow those ESIs and seek advice from a vet. Thank you, Matt. Uh, the next question I have uh, is probably for Tim. Uh, so the question is, would liver fluke be reduced or impacted in fire affected areas? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I guess if it's gone through and burn out all those gullies and swamps, it's probably had a very good impact on the reducing the snail population. But I'd say you'll never get rid of the snail population, whether they've gone down into the mud or the eggs are still viable. But yeah, if you've gone through and it's burned out all your gullies, that's probably reduced the, the snail population by quite a lot, I would assume. And all the ash and stuff going into the the water probably wouldn't be um, doing the snails any good either. Yeah, Thanks, I haven't really thought about that one. 
Um, the next question I have uh, is, do you get a synergistic response using the clojolon and the triclobenzol together? Um, yes, you, you would actually. I assume that that's in response to the idea of a dairy cow, uh, not that one, sorry. Um, so if you are giving the clorsalon in Verbamec Plus at the same time as in triclobenzol, yes, you, there is a known synergy that New South Wales DPI found with that. Um, so what synergy means is that you'll get better kill of the fluke than if you use them individually, if that makes sense. So they, they help each other. Um, and you will get control a lower stage of fluke. So yes, you will. Okay, thanks, Matt. Uh, the next question is, if you can only use a product that kills adult fluke, is there a, a program of treating numerous times to kill a, a season's worth of fluke, for example? Uh, do you want to do that one, Matt, or do you want me to have a crack? Oh, you can start, Tim, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I would strongly uh, recommend not doing that. Because when you say you do have immature fluke or early immature fluke there and you give them an adult drench, you may, you're not killing them, but you are exposing those parasites, those young fluke to that drench again. So then if you do that every month, those ones that survive are going to be very, very resistant. And it's pretty much what we're, we're trying to avoid is by putting too many drenches in front of the parasites, because that's how we've unfortunately ended up in this situation because we have had the luxury of having some very good drenches for years and years now and we've, we've used them very uh, regularly because they've worked so well but yeah I, I'd recommend not doing that sort of thing because yeah as soon as you put more and more pressure on your adult uh, drenches they're going to fall over which is another thing we're trying to avoid we've got to make sure we use all the sort of tools in our arsenal in, in the right way. I suppose a quick comment there is if your only option because for slaughter stock you want a short ASI and therefore you you know need to use the adult one, um, you need to make sure that you're just putting those better fluke products into other stages. But in that situation, um, I mean, wrong one, flucazole with only a 56 day withhold, um, as long as you're happy to use a oral product. Um, would be fine for most people. All right, thanks, Matt and Tim. Uh, the next question is, would you treat cattle who live on a fluke property, however, don't show any signs of parasite burden? Uh, yes, yep, I think because most of the time you're your adult cows will show no signs of liver fluke infection. So regardless of whether they're looking big and fat and glossy, if it's if you know you've got liver fluke on your farm, you should be treating at those correct times because a lot of the, the impact is all subclinical and those cattle, those big adult cows might be all right for doing it, but then you're reinfecting your pasture, which is gonna impact your younger stock later on down the track. Thank you, Tim. Uh, the next question here is for Matt. Um, what are the combination drenches for worm control and is it safe to use them on the same day as fluke treatment? Yeah, okay, that's a good question. So combinations are what we're recommended to use. And first of all, unless there's a specific uh, contraindication, so don't do on the label, they should be safe. So in Australia, some registered combination worm drenches include Eclipse Poron, which is abamectin and labamazole, you also have trifecta, which includes three ingredients orally, um, and they're the only registered ones made all together. But it's important to know that often producers are doing the same thing every day in Australia without realising it. For example, as I mentioned, if you use cydectin poron as the same day as flucazole, you've just made yourself a really nice combination. So we as scientists call that concurrent use which achieves exactly the same thing. So they don't have to be mixed in the drum necessarily. Um, but as I mentioned, um, if you wanted to do the ultimate quarantine against worm and fluke, you would give them a nitrofluke injection and you would give them an eclipse pour on along the back. And then for you would have two actives against worm, two really good actives against fluke and your job is done. You may not keep that as your program for those animals longer on in your farm, like you know, you might get advice from your vet or your other advisor that 
instead you're going to um, use other drenches after that. But certainly at the point of entry to farm, that would be a way to achieve quarantining and totally safe to do. Thank you, Matt. Um, the next question is open to Matt or Tim. Can I use two different poron drenches with different actives at the same time? Trying to get a mectin, a levamazole and a triclobenzole on wieners. I better answer that one and unfortunately you can't. Um, we have on the label of most porons not to do it. Like it says in little small writing, don't use it at the same time as another poron. And the main reason is Porons are amazing how they get the chemical into animals um, and they use different solvents and different products and so it's not a good idea for them to mix. So instead what my clients and others you design is in that situation you might need to shift towards an injectable worm product to combine with a poron that you want to use. So a lot of people these days, so for example, if you were using say a sodectin injection or sodectin long acting, um, and you don't need to worry about flukes, people put on a levamazole pour on the same day and they've made concurrent. If you wanted to um, make up a fluke thing, um, once again, you could use, say, nitrofluke injection or nitromech injection and do a separate levamazole pour on. So I'm sorry, you just can't do two pour ons at the same time. It's quite a common question for me and Verbach to say, can I use sodectin pour on and a rest on the same day? So I get fly and worm and everything. And I always say, I'm sorry, you've got to wait till one's gone in first and, and do your other job later. You can't put them on the same time. Thanks, Matt. Uh, the next question is, is on a similar vein. Uh, can you use nitrofluke injection, cydectin injection, vaccinate and potentially use a, a multimin injectable on the same day? Yeah, this is quite a common um, question coming up to vets and to companies because we realise that animal health products drive great productivity and then suddenly the cattle are becoming pin cushions. Um, and you, if you look in some dairy farms in Australia, how many needles they're getting at dry off, um, it's quite amazing. You know what? Pretty much is 100% safe. There's a few things you just need to be aware of. Um, you shouldn't put one product on top of another. So as much as possible, if you're using a injectable vaccine and then say multimin, we'll put them on the other side of the neck. Um, if you're then going to be doing an injectable drench as well, um, make sure that it's at least a good adult hand width away from your last injection. Um, so, you know, they're big enough animals to be able to do that. And also, um, you know, the products that are under the skin, you've got plenty of animal to play with. So the quick answer is, I can't think of any problem that occurs with um, most of the injections. There's a few unusual ones like tick fever vaccines, but the vaccines that pretty much everyone uses in Southern Australia, the multi-min, the drenches, you can give them all on the same day. But if you have any further questions about that issue, just ring the company's reps and they'll be able to help you. Thanks, Matt. Um, so we're a little bit over time, so I'll just ask two more questions. Um, and so this one is open to the floor. Um, because Nitromec is a big dose, do you rec recommend giving it in two injection sites? Yes, yeah, so um, the products um, Nitromec is a higher volume than say the Verbamec Plus. And so often I do give it in two injection sites for those large size animal, that's correct. Um, so yes. Okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, and final question. Probably only um, if it's above, so just quickly on that, probably if it's yeah. only like heading above, I mean, I've put certainly 15 mils in one spot, but you know, a lot of people set their gun actually to do two shots, I have to admit. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, and the final question is, what are the recommendations for fluke treatment for wieners? So you need to consider what's happening to the wiener. So the recommendation can't be just one product from the store here. So if the wiener can absorb a long ESI, well then you really, your best product is gonna be one, is gonna be nitrofluke. Now, its best choice is not going to be Nitromec, 
because ivermectin is not the best chemical for worm control in a wiener. Okay, you're much better to use something like moxidectin. Okay, so if you can absorb that ESI, the quick, quest, the quick answer could be this is the best product, nitrofluke. However, if you are chasing a shorter ESI, um, you can argue that instead flucazole um, is a good option. Now, the other reason that flucazole is a good option for the wiener is because of that worm chemical in there, oxfendazole, which is really rarely given to cattle by people. And so it's an amazing opportunity to back up your mectin type drenches easily when you give the fluke drench. So to share for you, I mean, what happens in my family's cattle is I actually tend to rely mainly on cytectin long acting and flucazole same day in young animals. Um, I'm very happy with that. And I know that ideally if I could, I would put nitro into them. But what I do is I make sure that the mature cows get nitrofluke. Every breeder gets nitrofluke. And if heifers are gonna be retained, um, as I said, like at pregnancy testing, they will get that as well. Um, and I tend to keep the flucazole as my number one fluke drench choice in a wiener. That just to share my, my own thing of what I do, but it means that on my farm, I'm getting multiple actives because you see the fluke is on the same farm. Um, the fluke, the fluke that are that, that it's the same farm, the same parasite. So I can achieve a combination approach and swapping and rotation and all those words we use by just making sure my adults are getting nitro and I'm sticking with flucazole for my wiener. All right, thank you so much, Matt uh, and, and Tim. So unfortunately, it's time to wrap up the webinar. Um, if anyone has any further questions. Um, that they might like to ask, please don't hesitate to contact us and we can get in touch uh, with yourself and, and get you in touch with someone who can help. Um, I'd just like to offer a quick thanks to Tim and Matt again for their presentations tonight, uh, as well as for their insightful answers to the questions. Uh, but most importantly, a sincere thank you for everyone who attended tonight. Um, Verbac are running a range of webinars over the next few months across a range of animal health topics. Uh, so if you'd like to be a part of these, please visit our webinars page on our website or simply Google Verbac webinars. Finally, to improve our information delivery, there's a quick one minute survey at the conclusion of this webinar where you can let us know of any future topics you'd like us to discuss. So I'd like to thank you again uh, for coming. Um, I hope everyone has a great night and uh, please stay safe and we hope to see you again at the next webinar. Thank you.